anger over the haunting images of the death of George Floyd sparked a worldwide movement. But there's another movement, though little known, gaining traction marked not by images, but by two words many have never heard, qualified immunity. If I understand correctly, it effectively acts as a shield. That's exactly right. And that's why we call qualified immunity an unlawful shield, because it, it is a shield for public officials who have committed constitutional violations to escape accountability for their actions. When police use excessive force that may violate a person's rights, that person can try to recover damages by claiming a violation of civil rights. But increasingly, those claims are not even given their day in court because of the doctrine of qualified immunity and its widespread application in civil cases seeking police accountability. The law's origin comes from the Enforcement Act of 1871, designed to protect recently freed slaves after the Civil War. Over the years, a section of the law protecting public officials in the course of their work evolved into today's version of qualified immunity, a doctrine created by the Supreme Court. It essentially provides a shield of liability against civil lawsuits so long as the public official's conduct does not violate clearly established law. The way it works in practice is that courts will require would-be civil rights plaintiffs to find a prior case already decided in their jurisdiction where someone else's rights were violated in essentially the same way. And given no two cases are exactly the same. Qualified immunity routinely enables public officials, especially members of law enforcement, to get away with egregious misconduct just because they happen to be the first ones to commit that exact kind of misconduct. For example, after being cleared of any wrongdoing, a Cleveland man filed a lawsuit alleging he was punched in the neck and jailed by police who never identified themselves but suspected he was breaking into his own apartment. A judge ruled because of qualified immunity, neither the police nor the city could be sued. And an appeals court in 2019 ruled two California police officers who allegedly stole over $220,000 while executing a warrant also couldn't be sued simply because there's no legal precedent in that part of California. What should happen when a Schweikert isn't the violence. only one drawing attention to the legal challenge. Last year, a Reuters investigation reviewed some 500 cases over 15 years and found a trend. Courts denying victims the right to challenge violations of their constitutional rights, making it harder to win future cases against the police. In speaking with law enforcement, I found a willingness to reconsider the unintended effects of qualified immunity, followed by a hesitation to end the principle seen as essential so police can carry out their daily duties without the constant fear of lawsuits. Captain Sonia Pruitt has served nearly 30 years with the Montgomery County, Maryland Police Department. Black officers play a really vital role in policing. It is a noble profession. As the head of the National Black Police Association, she says it's time to re-examine qualified immunity for law enforcement. We would ask that any of the parameters surrounding qualified immunity be examined because it could be a way for officers to uh, feel like that they will get more leniency if they commit an act, a violation of misconduct in the line of duty. Schweikert believes it not only thwarts justice, but works against the very men and women it's designed to protect. I think that this doctrine is doing a tremendous disservice to members of law enforcement because it is depriving them of the public trust and credibility that they need to do their job safely and effectively. And momentum for change is building. Among protesters honoring George Floyd, both liberal and conservative justices saying it's time to review the court's own solidified principle and lawmakers introducing legislation to revoke the provision for gun-carrying officers in an effort to combat excessive force and police brutality. It's a rare issue of consensus across ideological lines seen recently on criminal justice reform. Nicole Porter witnessed the power of the faith community when she worked to advance the First Step Act. In my work at the state level, faith communities are key in representing a base of constituents who are supportive of criminal justice reform and talking about 
restorative justice and other alternatives of punishment. Many agree among the ways to honor George Floyd is to fix the broken system before it gets worse. My hope is that if you know we are able to address that now and make a simple but massive change uh, to eliminate this doctrine, you know, I hope that that will offer some small measure of redemption for the death of George Floyd and so many other people like him. What's his name? George Floyd! John Jessup, CBN News, Washington.